All right, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, so I don't know what happened to my my Dropbox on my um, my laptop, but it didn't update. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna present from the PDF that um that I uploaded earlier. It isn't substantially different. It just doesn't have the liquid questions on here. Um, so I'm going to do my best to remember the ones that I grabbed because there are some that were relevant. Um, the first one that comes to mind is somebody asked um, why if we have carbonate, why don't we have carbonite? Carbonite does not exist outside of Star Wars. Um, and that's predominantly because uh, um, if you look at a Lewis dot structure for carbonate, so the CO2, the negative two charge, we follow our naming rules for polyatomic ions. We count all that up, that gives us a total of 18 electrons, I think. Um, which, and then if we use all those up, So that used 16 of our 18, which means then we need a small pair on the on the um, carbon, and I can't using this. Uh, um, I would have to erase one of these lone pairs and turn it into a double bond. That's an okay compound. It's not the most stable though, because if you look at formal charges, the carbon's got a negative one formal charge. And this oxygen also has a negative one formal charge. It's just not as stable as it could be if we, um, if the carbon gave away that pair of electrons, we could just turn it into CO2, which is way more stable. So this compound could exist technically, um, but it'd be way more likely to exist if we. Here's what I can do to get to a whiteboard easily. This is an eraser. We'll just open a blank page. Um, so instead of setting up like that, if you do something that looks really similar, but instead of having a lone pair, if you stick an H plus on that carbon. Then you get a carbon with four bonds instead of three plus a lone pair, which means the charge on the formal charge on the carbon is zero now, which makes it more stable. And this still has a negative one charge, but that compound is a lot more stable. And that's formic acid, well, formate, because it's not uh, protonated. If you added the H there, you would get something that. So if you, if you set it up like that, that looks kind of similar to what I had drawn before. This was a lone pair and this was just a negative charge, but this is a more stable state because that gives everything a formal charge of zero. So this is formic acid and you get rid of that hydrogen and make that a negative one charge, that's formate, um, and that is stable enough to exist. So we don't get carbonate. Instead, because we have so much water around on earth, we get um, formate. In theory, if you happen to have a specific environment that is really, really low in water and really, really low in hydrogen atoms, um, which would be really uncommon because hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, uh, but you could, in theory, have something that would make a compound that looked like carbonite that we would probably name carbonite, but it's not going to form any stable ionic compounds really because the second you give it something to react with, it's going to rearrange to something more stable. But I liked that question because I'm a Star Wars nerd too. So um, why don't we have carbonite? That's why. Um, another question, somebody asked a really good question about um, taking the derivative. I mentioned something at one point about taking the derivatives of orbital functions. Um, and so somebody asked, why would we ever do that? Um, it, because it turns out that if we think of these orbitals as, as just these functions, and I'm just gonna draw it as being two dimensional, but really, we, we know that this is three-dimensional shape that looks like these two balloons attached. Um, and really, even that's more like a bell curve. It's a probability function. Um, if you take the derivative of this, what you really are looking at then is the curvature 
because derivative is the slope of a function at any given time, right? If you take the derivative of an orbital function, you get something related to the curvature, and the total curvature of these functions um, is is proportional to the energy of these functions. So go back to that, that guitar string analogy. If we had a guitar string vibrating like this versus, let's see if I can do this in even thirds, uh, not bad. The blue line has more curvature, which means that vibration is higher energy, which means in terms of sound, we hear it as a higher pitch. Orbitals work the same exact way. The more curvature there is to the orbital, the higher energy the orbital is, which is why as you go from an S orbital to a P orbital to a D orbital, they get progressively more complex in terms of their shape because they have more and more curvature and that curvature is related to the energy. So we wouldn't necessarily take the derivative by hand of any of these, but understanding conceptually what the derivative represents um can be really helpful and then using a computer to actually take the derivative especially when we start talking about molecular orbitals that are linear combinations of these separate orbitals um and then trying to figure out what the what the energy is of these other orbitals that are really mixtures of these simpler functions that are themselves not that simple um that's where you start wanting to understand the concepts behind it um, another thing that we do with orbitals is um, I keep presenting the orbitals as though this is a probability function. Technically, electron density is the squared version of this. So it's the orbital function squared to remove that phase of that, um, that uh, where we would have this, you know, one of these colored in versus the other. Say that that's an opposite phase when it comes to constructive interference. You actually to get the, the probability density, you technically have to square the function. Um, so we do actually do a lot of things where we start with the basic orbital shapes and then mathematically transform them or optimize them or mix them together to represent what actually happens when we have these, these atomic orbitals turning into molecular like orbitals. Um, so a lot of high-end multivariable calc and linear algebra concepts involved here. Um, but just conceptually, this is a really good question um, because it lets me talk about, remember, the more nodes you have, by definition, the more curvature you have. And the more curvature you have, the higher energy that function is. Okay. It's not necessarily speed, right? It's not necessarily speed. It's, it's the energy that an electron would have to be to, to exist in that state, um, which can be related to speed. Speed's going to be a component of it, but it's also potential energy in the form of these vibrations as well. Remember, it's not physically vibrating, but it behaves a lot like that. Just by having an, an electron that has this blue shape to its orbital, that electron inherently has more energy, even though it might be moving at the same speed as an electron that's in this red function. And so it gets a little bit weird um, but you can you can think about it um, not in terms of speed, but just sort of like the act of existing sometimes is has energy associated with it, right? Um, to put that to an analogy, like everybody has that friend that's always like on the brink of disaster. Just by them existing, they are in a high energy, stressful state. Um, sometimes feel like that about ourselves, right? Um, like. It's not that they inherently have more energy than you, just something about the state that they exist in is higher stress. We could say that they have more curvature to their wave function. Um, it is a way of uh, saying that subtly. You don't want them to know what you're saying, really. Um, but then you get into a discussion of quantum mechanics, and then they probably forget why they asked you about it anyway, and then you, you've dodged the bullet, gotten off the hook. Um, but. Uh, there were a couple more questions, but I, that's what I can remember off the top of my head. Inigo, what was your question last week? I, I remember I grabbed yours because it was the second one I graded, and I looked at it, and I copy and pasted it. Do you remember what it was? I was talking about steel. 
Like it was like yes, yeah, you asked if, the, if there was anything that had better properties than stainless steel that we could potentially replace steel with in the future. Um, and I liked that question because it lets me talk about the fact that better properties is not an objective thing. It depends on what we're using it for, right? We use stainless steel for a lot of things because it has pretty good properties for a lot of applications in terms of resisting corrosion, in terms of being a decent conductor, things like that. Um, but it's not perfect for everything. And there's constantly new research being done into material science that says like, well, we could use stainless steel, say for a bike frame. That's not great for a bike frame because it's really, really dense, right? It's really heavy. It'd be really durable to do that, but it'd be really hard to pedal a stainless steel mountain bike up a hill, right? Um, so we use different metals like titanium or aluminum in that case, it's because they have, they're almost as strong as steel. They're strong enough for, um, to make a mountain bike out of, but they're way lighter. So there's always like a, there's always a trade-off between these different, these different, um, properties and different applications. Um, stainless steel would be unlikely to be totally replaced because one, it is very resistant to corrosion and things that are more resistant to corrosion are basically things like gold and silver and they just cost way more we have a lot of iron and a lot of chromium and some of the other components of stainless steel that are pretty cheap relatively speaking so stainless steel is a really good all-around material because that'll, we can kind of use it for a lot of applications and it's expensive but it's not that expensive compared to something like gold um so but again, if you go into the material science field, you'll find that there's huge amounts. And there's somebody else asked about superconductors um, last week, too. Um, and that's another example of a superconductor is basically a material that when you get it below a certain temperature, it has zero resistance. And it doesn't mean like approximately zero or zero within sig figs. A true superconductor literally has zero resistance, which would make it really, really good for a lot of electrical applications, right? If we had a material with zero resistance, there's nothing stopping us from building, from basically turning Arizona, the entire state, into one giant solar panel farm and shipping the electricity all the way to New York City. If there's zero resistance along that whole pathway, then we don't lose any of that energy along the way. Um, the problem is, is that most superconductors have to be kept below liquid nitrogen temperatures um, in order to be a superconductor. And even that's pretty warm. A lot of superconductors are more in the like five to 10 Kelvin range. If you can get it down to five to 10 Kelvin, then it has absolutely zero resistance. You would just have to keep an entire um, power line all the way from Arizona to New York City at five to 10 Kelvin for that to work. So, but a lot of research is going into like, well, we can use copper wire for this stuff, or we could use some mixture of copper and silver that has lower resistance, or we could try and develop better superconductors that maybe can be kept at 100 Kelvin instead of 5 Kelvin. Um, and so a lot of that, that material science research is happening to basically improve things we already have solutions for, but they could be better. Um, and superconductors and metal alloys are two of the biggest areas that there that research is happening. And if you had the third question that I, or the fourth question that I can't remember that I wrote down, then we'll address it on uh, on Thursday, as well as any questions from the back half of the alphabet when I finish grading those quizzes. All right, so what we're going to work on today is we're going to talk more about chemical reactions. So this is sort of going to beef up your understanding that we gained from lab this morning or yesterday. Um, and then we're going to start talking about how we can tell, how we can classify reactions a little bit better. Um, if you are, instead of trying to predict what the products are, which we're going to get some practice with that too, but um, if I give you the entire reaction, can you put it into one of our, our types of reactions um, with a little bit more um, clarification uh, when it comes to the difference between a redox reaction and a complexation reaction. And then we'll start getting into how do we do math with chemical reactions, which is going to be the last big topic um, we're going to spend a lot of time on. It's going to be 30% of the final exam. The final exam is going to be stoichiometry, which is effectively how do we know how much product we can make based on how much reactant we start with. 
All right, so let's do some uh, some practice. This is going to be a pretty qualitative lecture. Um, let's do some practice with uh, concentration. So I throat spray. Is anybody ever you know when you get a sore throat and there's that that throat spray that you spray in the back of your throat and makes you gag and um, tastes really gross, um, but then it numbs your throat and you feel acceptable for you know 15 minutes. Um, that's phenol is the compound that that is. Uh, um, that is used as that topical anesthetic. It also gets used as a topical anesthetic in nursing, um, and sometimes even as a uh, sanitizer. Um, sometimes you get your skin wiped. It's not always iodine that gets used. Sometimes they use phenol because it stains less um, before uh, an injection. Um, and it has this specific formula. If the solution is listed as having a concentration of 1.40% by mass, and the rest of it is water, and it has a certain density, what is the molarity of that solution? Remember, molarity is equal to moles of that compound divided by the volume of that compound. Oh, sorry, volume of the solution. So if we can figure out those two numbers for any size solution with these characteristics, we can figure out what the molarity is. You're not sure where to start. I'll give you a hint. Moles and volume are both extrinsic properties, meaning if you have more of something, then that number goes up, right? But this is an intrinsic property. Concentration, it doesn't matter how much you have of a solution. The concentration should be the same, right? Like density. So if we don't, if we're trying to get to this from these extrinsic properties, we can actually pick any amount to start with that we want that's convenient. And with that in mind, just sort of pick up an amount, say I have 100 grams of the solution, and use that to figure out how many grams of phenol you have, and from their moles. And if you have 100 grams of solution, you can use the density to figure out liters of solution, right? Sorry. Yes. 94. 94. Yes. Decimal. Right. So just adding up the pieces. C six H six is benzene, which would be eighty four. A mass of eighty four. No, I can do this. Six is uh, eighty-eight. No, I'm adding something wrong in my head. Regardless, the point remains: you get ninety-four grams of mole. Use that as a conversion. That gives us our moles of phenol. We'll get something like zero point zero one four. And give me. We have three sig figs on our concentration, so give me one more. Nine. So we just found moles of phenol. 
which means all that's left is to figure out if we have 100 grams of solution, how many liters that is. And so to get from a mass to a volume, we're going to use the density. Because we have for every 0 0.9956 grams of solution is one mole, or sorry, is one uh, milliliter. And we can then go 1,000 milliliters is one liter. Get something just over point, no, just, uh, yeah, just over point one. What do we get for the number? 0 0.0100. 0 0.01? 0 or point one. Wait, zero, 0.0100. So we started with a hundred divided by something really close to one. This is also gonna be really close, just above a hundred. And then divide by a thousand should not be point oh one, it should be point one. Zero point one. Okay. With it, is it uh, and to take it to three sig figs is all we really need since that's all we keep up here. So we're going to get something like our concentration C6H5OH is going to be really close to so 0.149. That's moles per liter or represented with that capital M. Anybody have any questions about this one? Anytime we're trying to convert concentration units from one concentration unit to another concentration unit, it can be helpful to write out the unit that you're trying to get to and say, okay, this, like if I wanted percent by volume instead of percent by mass, I would need volume of phenol divided by the volume total. And so I would, then I just need to find a way to get those two volume numbers, right? So just a way to organize your thoughts I'm trying to change it to these units. How can I do that? Um, or I'm trying to get moles of phenol divided by volume solution as a way of just sort of getting yourself started. Nobody's gonna ask me about the way that I wrote the formula for phenol? Almost always. Somebody says, if I say C6H5OH, Almost always, somebody will immediately say, well, why, why don't you just write C6H6L? Because in organic chemistry especially, this actually tells us something about how the Lewis dot structure is arranged. So in this particular case, C6H5 is a benzene ring with something attached to it. So a benzene ring looks... I've drawn this structure for you before. It's surrounded by hydrogens, except if it's C6H5, that means one of the hydrogens isn't there and you've replaced it with the oxygen, which is then attached to the hydrogen. So the reason why we don't combine all of the hydrogens together, even though that would be the same as far as the molecular weight, there are a lot of compounds that have the same formula in a lot in this case, but there's a significant number of compounds that have the same formula C6H6O, but pulling it out and writing the OH separately tells you what's attached to what. It conveys a lot of information once you know what you're looking for. So a lot of times with organic compounds, we don't combine them. And actually, just as another example, something that y'all have been working on learning how to name, what is that compound? Ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate. We wouldn't want to combine the ends here because then it's really hard to see that it's ammonium nitrate, right? It's really easy when you write it like this to say, oh, well, I know that that's ammonium and I know that that's nitrate. If I write it as, um, you know, H4N2O3, it's really hard to see what that is, right? So we see the same thing with organic compounds a lot that 
you don't necessarily have the background to know what's being conveyed, but that's all the reasoning for not just combining it and condensing it as much as possible is because there is more information there. You might just not know what to do with yet. All right. So let's recap on types of reactions. And I'm going to go back to using the, the classification method that um, we're going to talk about more. It's more theory based. It's more on um, understanding what's happening um, in the reaction rather than the one from the lab, which was basically classifying it by what the net result was. To me, this makes more sense, especially since we've spent all, all that time and energy understanding electrons and orbitals and Lewis dot structures. This will help us understand it, what's going on a little bit better. Right. So we're going to pre predominantly stick with this um, method of classifying. When it comes to the final exam, um, there's a bunch of, of uh, places where I say, what type of reaction is this? I'm generally looking for one of these options, not double replacement or a displacement reaction, um, because this is a little bit more closer to the truth, I guess, of, of what's actually happening. Um, that said, if you write an exchange reaction on the final exam and you're right, I'll accept that, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time classifying and using those, those terms. Um, so, and a reminder, what we were basically looking at is this is the, the term here that we use more frequently is redox because it's fewer syllables and we like to abbreviate things. Um, and the complexation reactions are the ones where I basically said not redox. Right, so basically a complexation reaction means you're changing what's attached to what, but all the electrons are more or less staying with the same atoms that they started with. So, and the, there's a lot of different versions of complexation reactions. You'll add even more when you get it further along in um, even just in this series of chemistry, we'll talk about complex ion formation um, when you get to equilibrium reactions and things like that. Um, but it's this is kind of the one, the basic complexation reactions are going to be either a precipitation reaction or an acid base reaction. Right? In precipitation reaction, I can remind you what that means now that you've done that lab. That's when you mix two solutions together and then made a solid. Remember, you had all the same pieces before and after. You just happened to make some combination of ions that no longer dissolved. And then the acid-base reactions look really similar. Your products and your reactants look very similar to each other, but you should be able to recognize one thing that's missing an H plus ion and something else that gained an H plus ion. So the only thing that's happening in the acid-base reaction is we're just moving an H plus around. But all of the, but since an H plus doesn't have any electrons with it, H plus is, remember hydrogen when it's neutral only has one electron, right? So an H plus is just a single nucleus by itself. And so moving an H plus is not a redox reaction, even though the charges on the entire molecule might change. But we're not changing any of the orbitals really we're not changing what electrons what what orbitals have electrons in them we're just moving that h plus around and then the um, metal the oxidation reductions again there's a whole bunch a whole, of ways we can classify them um, but for the most part and sometimes you can even have a combination of these like we saw in um, in lab when you put the zinc metal in the uh, hydrochloric acid, it bubbled really quickly, right? That was a gas evolution reaction that also was the zinc being oxidized. So it was sort of a combination of two of these. We had gas evolution happening because it was bubbling and producing hydrogen gas. And then we also had a metal being oxidized. Right? And so these ones get a little bit hazy with what what type of reaction is what, but you're always safe. If you can recognize something as having a charge changing, then you can just call it, say it's a redox reaction. And I can't really decide between a metal metal redox or between a gas evolution redox. 
Um, the exception here is that combustion is a very specific type of reaction. And combustion is actually probably the easiest of any of these to recognize. Um, somebody who had Chem 100 with me, how do we recognize a combustion reaction? It makes CO2 and, makes CO2 and water and starts with a, um, something with carbons and hydrogens reacting with oxygen gas. So all combustion reactions have the same basic form. It's something with some carbons and hydrogens and maybe some oxygens uh, plus O2 is a gas and it always reacts to make CO2 water. So anytime you can you can look at a reaction and say oxygen reacting with something with carbon, one, this is our only carbon-based reaction that we know at this point. So even if I didn't fill this in, if I just write it like this with numbers instead of X, Y, and Z, you would just say, oh, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know it's going to make CO2 and water. And then all you have to do is the trickiest part of combustion reactions is always just balancing them. But they always make CO2 and water. All right, so more information on these complexation reactions, the acid base reactions. Again, it's a transfer of a single H plus. And I'm actually pretty quickly going to stop saying H plus um, because the more common way to refer to this is we call it a proton transfer. Because if hydrogen, when it's neutral, is a nucleus with one electron, most hydrogens have, have a mass of one, right? which means it's basically just a single proton with an electron around it. You take away that electron, an H plus ion is basically just a proton that sticks to other electrons wherever it bounces around. And so we, we frequently call these proton transfer is another way of, of um, saying something is an acid-base reaction. Right. And again, you, a lot, if you have, are moving one H plus around, the charges on your individual molecules might change by one, but you should still be able to recognize the same basic atoms besides the hydrogens are, should still be around on both sides. That one. Close. So, for instance, if we had something like something that you would name as an acid is, is pretty much a dead giveaway that there's some proton transfer happening on some level, especially if you can look at it and recognize the same basic pieces on the, on the product side. So in this case, if we had carbonic acid and ammonia, ammonia can act as a, as a base, and I'll define these terms again here in a second. Um, and the carbonic acid can give up the H plus. And so you wind up with your carbonic acid now being down in H plus. So it's now hydrogen carbonate. And the ammonia accepted the H plus. So it goes from being ammonia to ammonium. And so the nitrogen had three hydrogens around it and was neutral. And then we stuck an extra H plus on it. So it's still the same nitrogen. We just bombed on an extra H plus. And the, the carbonic acid now is no longer neutral. So we wouldn't name it as a carbonic acid, but it's still the same carbon that's now just missing one of those H pluses. And so acid base reactions are pretty much always going to look like this. Um, and the way we describe these is clear this way. Um, we whatever is losing the H plus and whatever is losing the H plus, we describe that as as the acid, 
And let me keep my color coding H theo three minus one and So if we look at, at just what's happening to the blue compounds, carbonic acid turning into hydrogen carbonate and lost in H plus. The red compound looks like NH3 goes to NH4 plus. So we need to gain an H plus here. So the way we classify these is say, okay, well, this blue compound is called the acid in this situation. And the red compound is the base. So in general, you're never just going to have an acid reaction or just have a base reaction. You have to have an acid and a base for anything to happen. You're not, not just gonna give away an H plus. It has to go to something that can accept it, that has a lone pair basically that that H plus can glom onto. Right? And so the, the Opposite terms, the acid turns into when car carbonic acid acts as an acid, it always turns into the same thing. It always turns into hydrogen carbonate. And so this is what's called the conjugate base. So conjugate in its in its English sense, basically just means the, the piece that goes with it. it means like, like a puzzle piece almost. The, if you put two jigsaw pieces together, the two shapes that line up could be considered conjugates of each other. So basically, and the acid turns into the, its paired conjugate base, and the conjugate and the base turns into what? A conjugate acid. So anytime ammonia acts as a base, it doesn't matter where the H plus comes from. If it accepts an H plus, it turns into the same compound every time. And the other way of thinking about it is the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. Oh, sorry, I did that wrong. Um, that's conjugate acid on that last one um is if you think about it as if the reaction went backwards what's the acid and what's the base so if the reaction we started here and the reaction went this way it would be ammonium acting as the acid and hydrogen carbonate acting as the base right because we're just undoing what we did before so, and the other the other way you hear this referred to is conjugate acid base pairs because these two are in are forever linked, right? Ammonia when it acts as an acid as a base will always make ammonia, and carbonic acid when it acts as a acid will always make the same conjugate base. It will always make hydrogen carbonate. Right. So the key to recognizing if something is an acid base reaction is if you have the conjugate base on the other side, it's the same molecule missing an H plus. As soon as you see that, you know that there's a proton transfer happening and overall reaction is an acid base reaction. At least partially, there are some reactions that are a little bit more complicated, but um, that's the easiest way to recognize an acid base reaction. Be able to see pieces same pieces matched up on both sides. Um, precipitation reactions are actually pretty easy to recognize too once you get the hang of it, because remember those are the ones where you made a solid by mixing together two solutions. And basically, at this point, we're only going to talk about them as, as ionic reactions. So if you have two two aqueous ionic compounds that, that are going to get mixed together and you have this all the same ions on the other side but one of those pairs is the solid that's a precipitation reaction it always looks the same thing two aqueous ionic reactants and you make one solid ionic product and one 
usually one that remains aqueous on the other side. And so the ones we did in class today are in lab. And for instance, the sodium chloride plus aqueous plus silver nitrate aqueous reacting to make silver chloride solid and sodium nitrate aqueous. Right? Start with two aqueous ionic compounds, end with one as a solid and one is still aqueous. It's always just switch them up. And if something happens, it's because we mixed a, a pairing together that is no longer soluble. So we can, we can actually pretty easily predict the results of a precipitation reaction if we have one of those tables of solubility rules, right? That say chlorides are generally soluble with the exceptions of silver, mercury one and lead two, for instance. Right? And that's the one in the lab is far from comprehensive. There are numerous other, that's what I'm looking for, ways we can um, describe this. So if you just look at good old Wikipedia, it's because I Googled it. It's not the exact solubility chart. There it is. You can actually get something that's more of a chart and less of a list of rules where you basically pick your cation on one axis and you pick your anion on the other axis and where they meet will tell you if that's soluble or insoluble. You'll actually notice that there's actually a few um, different ways. It's not all soluble and insoluble, soluble being blue and insoluble being red. There's also slightly soluble. The solubility is not really a binary state. It's not really soluble or insoluble. Everything is slightly soluble. And everything that's soluble has a limit to how much you can dissolve. Sodium chloride is soluble in water up to a point where you reach that saturation point, like we talked about when we talked about solutions. Um, in R, R representing. Reacts with water. So R basically means if you try to do this as a precipitation reaction, something weird happens and you get a different, basically get a redox reaction or gas evolution where you're going to instead form um, some different compound. So basically it means all bets are off. Um, so I'm not going to give you this super comprehensive version, um, but if I ask you to predict the results of a, of a precipitation reaction, I would have to give you a list of uh, solubility rules and you would just know have to know how, okay i'm looking at this this column is all soluble except with these exceptions right? and you would just say okay did i make anything that's insoluble and if every combination that you make is still soluble in water you just write no reaction happens because it's that would just look like you took two solutions mixed them together and then and then about that um you would just wind up with one combined solution that has all of those ions still floating floating around right so nothing really changed they were float the ions were floating around surrounded by water molecules separately and now they're all floating around surrounded by water molecules in the same container right so no reaction is pretty common with when you look at precipitation reactions all right, so if these are our two most common types of complexation reactions, they're not the only ones, but that means almost everything else. If, it, if you can look at it and immediately tell it's not acid base and it's not a precipitation reaction, pretty much everything else that we're going to talk about is a redox reaction. Right? And so those redox reactions, the easiest ones to tell that they're redox is when you do something like put a 
put a metal with a metal ion and see if anything happens. But we did this a bunch in lab. These are what those single replacement reactions, right? Or the displacement reactions with the lab called them, where that allowed us to make that activity series where we could say, well, definitely if this happens, that tells us that the zinc is more stable as a metal than sodium is as a metal, right? And we can tell that it's a redox reaction because everything is already by itself. It's all we have to do is look at the charges. If we started with sodium with no charge, and now we have sodium with a positive with a plus one, it had to have lost an electron to do that. And if it lost an electron, it's a redox reaction by definition. Right? So metals are really easy to tell. If it starts with a charge and it ends as a metal, or if it starts as a metal and it ends with a charge, it was either oxidized or reduced. Sometimes it's a little bit trickier to see, like zinc plus HCl, which again, we did in lab, right? It's a really common one. Um, you can also do this with aluminum um, because aluminum as a metal is also more active, is, has a higher activity than hydrogen does. Um, so if you take HCl plus zinc metal and you get zinc chloride, and we can recognize that this has to be a redox reaction because the zinc started with a charge of zero and it made an ionic compound. But that ionic compound, we can look at that and tell that there's a charge on the zinc, right? What's the charge on the zinc ion? Two. two. Plus two. Zinc's always plus two, right? But also remember chloride is a minus one. The chloride started as a minus one over here, and it's still a minus one. But the zinc goes from a charge of zero to a charge of plus two. Changing charge, redox. Boom, every time. And in this case, the hydrogen is starting. Remember how when we first talked about acids, I said, well, they're kind of like ionic compounds where your cation is hydrogen. Well, if the hydrogen started with a plus one charge, what does the charge have to be if it's H2 as a gas? If it's, it doesn't have a charge written, right? So the overall H2 molecule has to be neutral, has to be a charge of zero. And if the overall molecule is a charge of zero, that means each hydrogen has to have a charge of zero, right? Because you can't, if you just have two hydrogens attached, you can't have one that's H hydrogen with a plus charge and one that's hydrogen with a minus charge. They're identical, right? They're sharing electrons. They're covalently bound. So if that's the case, that has to have a charge of zero. So with these redox reactions, it's a little bit like identifying what's the acid and what's the base, except we're looking at what gained electrons electrons and what lost electrons. And as soon as you can recognize what gained electrons, what lost electrons, it has to be a redox reaction. As soon as any one thing changes charge, one atom changes charge, it has to be a redox reaction. And then last but not least, we already talked about combustion. But let's Look at combustion a little bit more in detail here. So we use methane, which is the main component in natural gas. Makes CO2 in water. How is this a redox reaction? It's a combustion reaction. It is, but that's a subcategory of redox. That's why it's on that, that slide. It is its own cast subcategory, but it's not as easy to look at this and tell that it's redox though, right? Because it, there's no metals and there's no ionic compounds for us to look at and say, well, this obviously changed charge, right? So we're basically going to treat this, um, we're basically gonna assign charges to all the atoms, even in a covalent compound as a way of estimating whether or not electrons changed hands, right? And so we're gonna use what are called oxidation states, which are kind of close to formal charge, um, but it's a little bit of a different focus because the goal with the oxidation states is to tell whether or not 
electrons changed hands, whether or not a specific atom has more access to electrons or less access to electrons. And so formal charge, we treated everything that was in a bond like it was evenly split between the two atoms on each side, right? Does everybody remember doing that? In this case, we're going to take the exact opposite approach. We're going to say that whatever has the high, higher electronegativity in a bond has exclusive full custody of those electrons. And then we total up the number of electrons something, quote unquote, owns by doing that. So in some cases, that's pretty easy to do. Oxygen, we just did this for hydrogen, but O2, what's the charge on each oxygen? Negative. When it's stable as an ion, it'd be negative two. But if it's present as ox oxygen gas, it doesn't have an overall charge. So it has to be what? Zero. Zero. So our oxidation state for oxygen here is going to be zero. If you then look at something like CO2, out of carbon and oxygen, which what's more stable or what's more electronegative? Oxygen, right? Closer to fluorine, it's more electronegative. So basically, we're going to treat this as like the oxygens are, are ions and have that same negative two charge that we just mentioned to become more stable. We say, okay, well, each oxygen has a negative two charge because it's the biggest bully. So we can basically just treat it like it owns all the toys. And so if the charge on each oxygen is a negative two, what does the charge, the oxidation state on the carbon have to be? Plus four, right? Because we need the oxidation states to add up to the overall charge. So that's the, the general gist of oxidation states is just treat it like whatever is most electronegative controls all the electrons or gets their first pick of electrons. Whatever is less electronegative has to deal with what's left over. So what's the out of hydrogen and oxygen, what's more electronegative? So oxygen is going to be more electronegative than anything but fluorine. So usually oxygen is the one that gets first dips. And how many electrons does oxygen need to be stable? Two. two. So it's a negative. This is once again is a negative two charge on the oxygen, which means each hydrogen has to be what? Uh, plus one, and there's two of them. I wrote that a little backwards, but the point is made, right? Yeah. And how about over here? With methane, CH4, what's more electronegative out of carbon and hydrogen? Carbon. So what's the charge going to be on carbon? It's got to be negative four. Remember, carbon needs to gain all the way to, to um, four electrons to get a full valence. So the carbon over here is minus four. And the hydrogen, once again, then has to be what? plus one, and there's four of them. So the fact that we can, this allows us to take something that doesn't have charges the way we normally think about them and kind of approximate what it would be like. And that allows us to look at this and say, well, the carbon's a minus four here, and it's a plus four there. It lost electrons. Even though it still has a full valence on both sides, now it's sharing with the biggest bullies as opposed to being the bigger bully. Carbon graduated from elementary school and goes from being the biggest kid on the playground to being the littlest kid on the playground. Right? And so that change means that the carbon, even though it still has a full valence, has less access to those electrons than it used to. So we can still consider this a redox reaction because the oxidation state of the carbon changed. What else changed oxidation states? Oxygen. Oxygen went from zero, and now all of our oxygens over here are paired up with things that they can bully, right? So all of our oxygens on this side are minus two. 
and our oxygen started with a charge of zero. So oxygen also changed hands. In our bullies on the playground analogy, oxygen is um, two homeschool ninth graders that get sent back to middle school. And all of a sudden they're the biggest kids on the playground. They were the same strength. And so they had to share evenly. But then when you put them on the playground with everybody else, they now run the show. And so oxygen usually is going to be the dominant factor. Like I said, if oxygen's involved, unless there's also fluorine um, or a very limited number of electrons, oxygen is going to be minus two when it's stable. All right, let me. There's one more thing I want to look at. And that's so basically. <laughs> when we when we can recognize electrons changing hands, just like we can look at an acid base reaction and say, okay, this is the acid, this is the base, because that's where the proton started and that's where it ended. We do the same thing with electrons, we just use different terms. Um, and there's, there's a couple of ways of uh, remembering this, but the, the one that people seem to um, remember the best is uh, oil rig or Leo the lion says dirge. Oil rig is an acronym that stands for oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. The reason we have to be careful with this is all Ben Franklin's fault once again for putting a negative charge on electrons. When something gains an electron, its charge drops, which makes sense, right? If we keep in mind that electrons are negative, but it means that it's tricky because when something is reduced, that means that it gained electrons. When we say something is reduced, we're talking about the charge is reduced. And oxygen is the opposite. Or sorry, oxidation is the opposite. Oxidation means that something lost electrons. In other words, the charge went up. Um, so in, if you go the Leo says Ger approach, it's Leo stands for lose electrons is oxidation. And Ger is gaining electrons is reduction. Right, so they're just two different ways of remembering the same thing. You can also just remember it from everyday language use. If you just remember what do metals do when you leave them out in oxygen? They oxidize. And metals, do metals ever gain electrons when they're already metal, when they're already neutral? Yeah. They always lose electrons, right? So you can also just use, okay, well, I know metals oxidize, and I know from the periodic table that metals lose electrons. Therefore, oxidation must be losing electrons and reduction is the opposite. Um, and literally the word oxidation comes from metals reacting with oxygen because metals reacting with oxygen gas get oxidized. And other compounds like carbon hydrocarbons, you take away a bunch of carbon carbon bonds or a bunch of carbon hydrogen bonds and add carbon oxygen bonds the carbon is more oxidized than it was because it has more oxygen attached to it. And it has the terminology though is because, is really based around where did the electrons go? All right. So anytime we have a change in oxidation states, we can determine what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. So in this reaction here, what is being oxidized? Carbon. And why? It's going from a negative four to a plus four. So negative four means it has lots of extra electrons. Plus four means it has too few electrons or has fewer electrons. So the carbon is being oxidized. What about the hydrogen? Is it being oxidized or reduced or neither? Neither. 
Neither. It's the same charge on both sides, right? It's the same oxidation state on both sides. It's neither oxidized nor reduced. And then what about the oxygen? It goes from a zero to a negative two. So it's being reduced. Its charge is dropping. It gained electrons, which means it's being reduced. All right. We're going to take our break after Ryan. Do you have a question or did I answer it? Okay. Um, we'll take our break now. Let's come back at 10 after, and then we're going to further confuse things because that's what we do. Yeah, so that's that's more more so if we had multiple options, we had bigger classes sometimes probably you know undominated really but that's fine. So, this comes from learned about oxidation states. Which basically, you know, like, I don't have any of that. But it really is better understood in terms of electronegativity. I mean, if you just look at, for instance, if we had something like, that would be fantastic. Oh, it would be more than that. Yes, multiple types of bonds attached to the same atom. Basically, look at every bond and say, okay, well, then for this bond, the oxygen yeah. gets controlled. Yeah. For this bond, the carbon gets controlled. So you just total up how many electrons like the carbon had. If you just treat every bond like whatever is more electronegative gets completely controlled. God, I that you have a bowl of eight electrons around the control right? So that would say that oxygen may also has eight electrons around it, and it controls all of them. So this oxygen is also the negative. Okay, we got it. So it's basically treating it like those bonds were just there. Exactly. Treat treat a covalent bond like it's an ionic. Oh, <laughs> 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 
All right. So we still have some people that are that are, are going to be coming back in to start talking about this. We sit down, right? Yeah. Um, so I just cleaned this up a little bit using the same example here. Then we'll do more practice with oxidation states. But I just wanted to define a couple of terms first. So we can look at this and say, okay, if the carbon went from a negative four to a positive four, therefore it lost electrons, which means it was oxidized. The oxygen went from a zero to a negative two. And if it went from a zero to a negative two, it gained electrons, which means it was reduced. The extra wrinkle I'm going to throw in now is that there are certain certain times where we want to describe how reactive a compound is. Um, and rather than saying something like oxygen is really good at being reduced, because that's not good grammar for in, in English in general, something is, we don't want to say oxygen is good at being reduced. It's, uses two different verb tenses and switches them. It's called a passive voice um, in English when you write it that way. So what we do instead is we say that oxygen is a good oxidizing agent. 
So when you see the word agent thrown in there, agent means we're basically we're switching the frame of reference. Instead of talking about what oxygen has happened to it, we switch it and make oxygen the active person or um, noun. And we say oxygen is good at oxidizing other compounds. So if something is being reduced that makes it the oxidizing agent. And oxygen being as electronegative as, as it is means it's a really good oxidizing agent. Again, that's where the term oxidizing comes from in the first place. So oxygen is a good oxidizing agent. And that means that whatever is being oxidized is what? The reducing agent. So the key is to remember that that word agent means we're not talking about the compound anymore. We're talking about what that compound does to everything else. Right, so it just switches that frame of reference. Um, and it's just something that takes a little getting used to. So because so sodium metal is a really good example. Sodium metal is really, really reactive. It's really bad at being a metal. It's really good at giving away an electron. So it's really good at being oxidized, which means the, the grammatically correct compact way to say all that is that Sodium metal is a good reducing agent. And again, it's one of those things that seems really nitpicky. Like, why, why am I teaching you this? This isn't an English class. Why do I care about the passive voice? Um, well, because this term shows up, and I want you to understand what it's referring to. And we do use the term agent in other places occasionally as well. Or um, in the same sort of context, what does it do to whatever you put it with, right? And it allows us to decouple carbon from this exact reaction to any reaction. Say, okay, carbon is a good reducing agent for a lot of different potential reactions, not just talking about what's happening in this exact reaction. And so, with that in mind, so the, the way I would ask. This on the, the final test is going to be something like this, um, where I would say, okay, here's a reaction. What's being oxidized, what's being reduced, and then label the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. So it'll be, you know, something like this. And we wouldn't even just say carbon is, is the reducing agent. In this case, we would say that. CH4 is the reducing agent. We're talking about a specific compound, not just one atom within the compound. Right? So it's just sort of a different frame of reference. It takes a little practice um, and people get hung up on that. That's why I'm spending so much time on this. So you said CH4 is the reducing agent, not so, so we would say, yeah, so the, the most correct way of saying this would be that methane or CH4 is the reducing agent. And oxygen, being it's just oxygen gas, that doesn't really change anything. So we just say oxygen gas is the oxidizing agent. All right, so again, subtle difference, but if we're talking about carbon is being oxidized, we're talking about the process, what the before and after, versus talking about the reducing agent means we're talking about this compound in particular has this property. Not regardless of what this exact change is. All right. Let me. So then um, the uh, these definitions are on the next couple slides. Um, there, the old school way of teaching oxidation state was. Frequently, oxidation state was actually covered before we ever talked about anything like electronegativity, which has always felt backwards to me. We, we, this class and this textbook kind of flipped the order. That's why it's called this an atoms first um, class is because we do the quantum and electron configurations and learn all that stuff and how to read the periodic table before we get into reactions. Classically, historically, the way to teach it was this is a chemical reaction. Don't doesn't matter what the letters are here. I'm going to teach you how to write it. 
um, doesn't matter what these different compounds are, what's going on. And so what they had instead of for oxidation, it was basically like a priority list. You start at the top, and if you have any fluorines, you make them a negative one. And then you go to the next one and say hydrogen can either be a plus one or a minus one or a zero. Um, and in this context, we do this. It basically, it's like a flow chart. This way makes less sense to me. I'm putting it up here because you still see this sometimes in some resources. If you're looking, watching videos or something like that, you might still see tables kind of like this. But what it always comes down to is when you have a covalent bond that's not the same atom on each side, you treat it like it's an ionic bond. And whatever's got the higher electronegativity gets first dibs on the electrons. And so that allows us to go beyond just looking at the uh, molecular formula, we can actually look at more complicated um, compounds. So for instance, if I say, oh, I just will go the C6H12O6, that's kind of a monster of a molecule of glucose, right? And it's really hard to look at that and identify what the various charges are going to be. We might even wind up with something that is not an integer number once we divide by the number of carbons and things like that. This is a lot easier if you break it up and you can look at every carbon. If we look at, at glucose and it's got this structure that looks like this, where every one of these carbons then has either an OH and a hydrogen attached to it, we can look at each of these carbons individually and assign an oxidation state to each of them once we have a, a Lewis dot structure. And we assign the oxidation state individually by saying, okay, well, here's a carbon, here's a carbon oxygen bond. Oxygen is more electronegative, it controls those electrons. So that doesn't count for the carbon at all. Here's a carbon hydrogen bond. Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it controls all of those. And then we've got two carbon carbon bonds. Those are the exact same strength, right? So basically, it, can, it does get half of each of these. So when we're assigning these oxidation states, it's really similar to a formal charge. And we can assign oxidation states for every carbon in the system. And then that allows us, when you get to biochemistry, you start looking at, okay, well, here's glucose. And the first step of glycolysis is this bond gets broken. Now, is that an oxidation step or a reduction step, or is it some other type of reaction? We can look at it and say, well, this carbon gained a carbon-oxygen bond, therefore it's oxidation. Right? So it allows us to use these same concepts in more complicated systems. Um, All right. So, but it, it, again, it always is going to come back to fill the most electric negative elements first. And whatever's left over is what your carbon and your hydrogen gets, or whatever else you have around. So, oh, I know that's fine. Um, so basically, now that I've shown you this, ignore it. Just look at electronegativity because you have electronegativity on your chart, on your conversion sheet already, right? And you always are going to have a periodic table around, at least for the remainder of this class. Um, if you really go the chemistry route and join the American Chemical Society as a student or as a um, as an instructor. Or as a working chemist in the future, they actually send you a little like business card size periodic table that you can keep in your wallet, and then you really are never without a periodic table. Um, but at the very least, for this class, everybody knows to never show up without a periodic table, right? So, with that in mind, finding the oxidation state for each element in the compounds below, for the most part, is just a matter of looking at charge. If it's an ionic compound, it's really straightforward. For sodium oxide, what's the charge on sodium? One plus. What's the charge on oxygen? Minus two. Minus two. That is the oxidation state for an ionic compound. Really easy. 
same thing we've been working at for a while. I'll work out for magnesium carbonate. Plus two. Magnesium is going to be plus two because we know that carbonate as a whole is a minus two, right? So magnesium has to be plus two. What about carbon and oxygen in carbonate? That gets a little bit trickier, but it still works the same way. We need every oxygen has to be a negative one charge or negative two charge, right? Especially if we draw the Lewis dot structure for carbonate, it looks like this, right? Every oxygen has a full valence and every oxygen is attached to the carbon, which means every oxygen has full custody over all the electrons around them. So every oxygen is a minus two. What is the charge on the carbon? Plus four. If you do this right, it'll always add up to the overall charge on the molecule. So if it's a neutral molecule, magnesium carbonate, all of your formal charge, or sorry, all of your oxidation states added up should add up to zero. But that also means we can do oxidation states for a polyatomic ion on its own. We don't need to worry about the magnesium. We can just look at carbonate. Or if we looked at nitrate, So nitrate is NO3 with a minus one charge. What's the, what's the oxidation state on each oxygen? So there's three of them, but each of them individually is gonna be what? Minus two, oxygen is pretty much always minus two. Unless you have oxygen bound to another oxygen or there's a fluorine involved then oxygen is always going to be minus two. And there's three of them. So what's the charge on nitrogen? It's got to be plus five, right? Because the overall has to add up to negative one. We could also look at this by say, by looking at the Lewis dot structure and say, okay, well, it looks like this, all the oxygens have full dibs, so the nitrogen basically has no electrons around it. And if a nitrogen loses all of its valence electrons, it would have a charge of well, five, right? Because it's in the fifth column over. So this still comes back to electron configuration and counting valence electrons in a lot of ways. And the other thing is that means that non-metals can actually have a positive oxidation state, we wouldn't say positive charge, but it behaves kind of like a positive charge. Nonmetals are mostly negative when they're most stable, right? But under certain circumstances, you can get a nonmetal that rather than gaining three electrons all by itself and becoming nitride, it's more stable based on how much oxygen is around for it to make these covalent bonds, even though that gives it a plus five oxidation state. And in general, these oxidation states are going to correspond to, okay, either gaining enough electrons to fill its valence, or if it's the least electronegative, it's going to lose enough electrons to empty its valence, or at least empty a specific orbital. So you could also have a nitrite, right? Nitrite is NO2 with the negative one charge. What's the oxidation state on the oxygens? Still negative two. But now we have only two of them. So what's the charge? Charge the oxidation state on the nitrogen? Plus three. Plus three. It only needs to counteract two oxygens, not three oxygens. What would nitrogen's electron configuration look like? Nitrogen, when it's neutral, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 
Three, right? Yes. So nitrogen could gain three electrons to have a negative three charge and have a full valence. It could lose five electrons to have only its 1s electrons left. Or we could empty the p orbital but not break up the s orbital. Which corresponds with a plus three. Right? So these oxidation states, the most common, the stable oxidation states for most of these polyatomic ions are going to correspond to enough electrons to fill the valence or enough electrons to empty an orbital or empty the entire valence. And so it, just to keep you thinking about orbitals because they don't go away. And this is why teaching oxidation states after electron configurations makes way more sense. Because it's not just memorizing random rules on the periodic table. Um, so here's another set of examples for phosphorus. Phosphorus really has a lot, a lot of options because it can break the octet rule, right? Because it's in that third row of the periodic table, which means there's numerous different oxidation states we can find phosphorus in, and it's pretty stable in a lot of them. So if we had phosphorus versus chlorine, which one has more electronegative? Chlorine. Chlorine is not as electronegative as oxygen, but it's only one, one block away from, from chlorine, right? So chlorine, sorry, chlorine has a is pretty electronegative. It's right there with nitrogen, right behind oxygen. So Chlorine is more electronegative. And how many electrons does chlorine need to get to gain to be stable? Seven. It has seven. It needs to gain one more, right? So if it gains one more electron, each chlorine would have a negative one charge. I keep trying to do that. This isn't, uh, isn't PowerPoint. So there's three of them, and they're all negative one. So what's the charge on phosphorus have to be? Positive three. Right, because if we have negative three over here, phosphorus has to counteract that, has to add up to the overall charge of the molecule. What about PCL5? Chlorine's still the most electronegative, right? Which means every chlorine still wants to be a negative one. Now there's five of them. Plus two, plus five. So that means the phosphorus has to be plus five. And over here, if we have calcium phosphide, now all of a sudden phosphorus is the most electronegative and gets to fill its valence first. So with that in mind, what do we do for the charge on phosphorus? Minus three, and there's two of them. Negative two plus two. Plus two. Which again, this is what we would expect. This is just an ionic compound. That's we don't have to get fancy with it. We can just look at this and say, well, I know calcium an ionic compound. Calcium has to be plus two, and phosphide is a minus three. But the fact that phosphorus can have all three of these different oxidation states is why you get polyatomic ions that are also relatively stable. Phosphide is stable, phosphate is stable, phosphite is stable, because they all have oxidation states that correspond to those electron configurations that are relatively stable. All right, let me, let's look at what to do when we have three different atoms and we can't separate them out. Let's look at CH4O and CH2O. So there's two ways that you can handle these where you start getting more than, than two atoms that we're considering at a time. If we're only looking at two atoms at a time, 
then it's pretty straightforward, right? Satisfy the most electronegative first, and then whatever's left is what the other one has to be. If there's three, though, it gets a little bit tricky. And so I'm going to show you two ways to do this. The first way is basically you start at both ends. Take your most electronegative and you make it stable. And then you take your least electronegative because it doesn't matter what the hydrogen is attached to. It's going to be attached to something that's more electronegative than it is. So if oxygen is most electronegative, it's going to be negative two. negative two still. If we assume that hydrogen is going to be losing electrons because it's the least electronegative, what's the charge on each hydrogen have to be? Plus one, right? Because hydrogen only has one electron normally and it only needs to lose one electron then. So hydrogen's gonna be plus one and there are four of them. So we've got a minus two and a plus four. Carbon just has to be whatever carbon needs to be to make up the difference so that it adds up to zero. So minus two. Minus two and a minus two and a plus four adds up to zero. And the other way of doing this is if you have a Lewis Stott structure, we look at every bond individually and just say, okay, well, out of the carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon's more electronegative. So that means that this central carbon controls those and those and those. So it has six electrons. And the carbon oxygen bond, the oxygen controls them. So for the carbon, it doesn't have those. So carbon has six electrons that it owns, that it has full custody of. And it has two more electrons that it doesn't see at all because the oxygen's in control. So carbon has six electrons, has four on the periodic table. So the charge on a carbon, in, on this carbon, that would then be negative two. Right, so this is a more universal approach. It's obviously way more work, but it lets us talk about individual carbons when we have something the size of glucose, where you've got different carbons that have different oxidation states, for instance. All right, so, but as far as this class goes, this is really the easiest way to do it, is you start at the ends, start with the most electronegative and make it satisfied, then you find the least electronegative and see how many electrons it has to lose. And then you fill in the middle with whatever it needs to be to make it add up to the right charge. And so it's a little bit of a process of elimination, a little bit of a logic puzzle, like balancing reactions. But when you see the logic to it, and once you start getting good at it, it's pretty straightforward. So let's do one more of these. It's also carbon and hydrogen based. CH2O. So the last one was methanol. This is formaldehyde. Do you have a question or not? Nothing changes about the process, right? Oxygen's still got to be negative two. Hydrogen is still our least electronegative and it can only be plus one. And there's two of them. Now these already cancel out on their own, right? Which means the charge on carbon has to be zero. zero. I keep saying charge, but technically it's oxidation state. The carbon doesn't actually have that charge. This is just a convenient way of estimating how many electrons it is in control of for the purposes of determining whether something is a redox reaction. And I will try not to do that, do this, but on compounds that have more than one carbon, um, it's easy to have, if we just take this approach, it's easy to find a um, oxidation state for carbon that's not an integer number. So we look at ethanol, which is C2H6O. We use the same approach. Get negative two. 
we get plus one, and there's six of them, which gives us a total of so plus six minus two and minus two is a plus four. I guess actually I, I picked a bad example for finding one that's non-integer. Um, but basically the, the problem with this approach is we would say, okay, well then that means each carbon has to be a minus two. Make it add up, right? But the problem is that both carbons are not identical. If we draw the actual structure out, this carbon is a minus four. Sorry, it's a minus three. And this carbon is a minus one. But on average, they come out to be a minus two. But they're not identical carbons in terms of their oxidation states. And so, again, this is why I sometimes, um, if I'm not careful when I write problems, I could do that to you unintentionally. If you get something that comes out to a non integer number for a charge, doesn't necessarily mean you did it wrong. It means that there's more than one oxidation state for that particular element in that compound. All right, so how do we apply this? Well, this is what's going to allow us to determine whether something is oxidized or reduced. So we already did one example of this. Um, but here's here's another example, and I always forget when I'm writing my slides for this lecture to just delete this table. Um, again, we don't need that. All we need is electronegativity. So for this compound or for this reaction, we want to know what's the oxidizing agent, what's the reducing agent, and to figure that out, we need to know what's gaining electrons or losing electrons, and to figure that out. We need the oxidation states. So what's the what's the easiest one to do here? NH. NA. The charge on sodium when it's neutral gotta be zero. Is there are there any other easy ones to do? OH. OH. Why? Because it doesn't it equal minus one? The whole thing does. Uh, so we're talking about both of these, though. We need oxidation state for the oxygen and the hydrogen. Oxygen is going to be negative two, negative two which means hydrogen has got to be plus one. So what we're used to seeing for oxygen and hydrogen, right? How about for water? Plus one. Same thing, right? Each oxygen is a minus two. Each hydrogen is a plus one. It's the same oxidation state for the oxygen and the hydrogen there. So those didn't change. What's the oxidation state on the sodium over here? Plus one. Because it has to be, it has to balance out the charge on the hydroxide, right? Hydroxide's a minus one, so sodium has to be a plus one. So sodium is going from zero to plus one. The water to the hydroxide, nothing changed. So what's the last one we have to look at? H2. H2. And the charge on hydrogen has to be zero. So the hydrogen starts, all of the hydrogen is a plus one initially. Some of the hydrogen stays at the plus one, but some of it turns to a, a charge of zero, which means it gained electrons and the charge was reduced. So the hydrogen from water is reduced to make hydrogen gas. 
which means the sodium that goes from zero to a plus one is getting oxidized. It lost an electron to go from zero to a plus one. So the sodium is being oxidized. The hydrogen from water is being reduced. So that means sodium metal is the oxidizing agent or the reducing agent? About a 50-50 mixture. So it's being oxidized, which means it's a reducing agent. It's reducing what we put it with. And water is the oxidizing agent. Typically, I don't get spend too much time on the final exam with reducing agent versus oxidizing agent, but I will make you write out and show me what's being oxidized and reduced. And then like a one point extra credit would be now that you've figured out what's oxidized and what's reduced, which one's the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent, right? So I'm not going to be too, too um, picky about that use of language, as long as you can recognize the other line that says GERD. Losing electrons is oxidation. And GER, gaining electrons is reduction. As long as you can remember that, that's more important than being able to use the agent terms properly. All right. This still has the solution on it because it's showing all the animated parts in the slide. Um, so this is just sort of setting the table and reminding us how moles to grams conversions works and how balancing reaction works, because that's where we're going next is now that we can identify what type of reaction it is and to balance it. The next step is being able to predict how much product we can make or how much reactant will be used up based on, on the information you're given. And so that's what we're gonna do in class on Thursday. Um, I'm gonna leave this one for now and we'll start with this one. So I'll let you out a few minutes early. Um, but try this one before you come to class on Thursday. Try to figure out how many moles are in five pounds of propane and write this combustion reaction out and balance it. It's already balanced, practice for yourself. Thank you. 